Jonathan, it is very nice to have you. Thank you for this interview. Uh, before we get started, I just want to say that this interview is not intended to replace any medical advice whatsoever. This is just mm -hmm. for educational purposes, okay? Mm -hmm. um, for my personal and other interest, how do you pronounce your last name? Kumateo. Kumateo. Kum yeah. Okay. Okay. Jonathan Kumateo. Um, I'm going to go through uh, various questions, and at the end, there's some questions from the male community, if that mm -hmm. is okay. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, that caught me off guard. So <laughs> I am a doctor from London, England. I was actually born in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is dead center of Africa. It was um, known as Zaire, and I came over here age seven. And I just turned 25 a few days ago. <laughs> um, so, I've, so I'd say, you know, Congolese born, but UK raised. And as an athlete, I've always been into sport, but I started boxing in 2011 and I signed my professional contract in 2020, earlier this year, um, when I finally sorted everything out. Nice, nice. So with that and being an athlete, when did your HS start? My HS started around, when I think I was 18, 18 and a half years old. So yeah, around that time. Okay. And how long did it take you, and I know you're in the UK, to get an official diagnosis? What happened was, or how my HS journey began was, I had an abscess on my underarm. It was just a small abscess, you know, as of that. And then it was there for a few months. It didn't hurt or anything like that. And I remember at that time, I used to shave my underarms a lot. So when I had the abscess, I just thought, you know, nothing much of it. It didn't hurt. But then I used to, at the time, I also used to suffer from um, acne. So I used to see my general practitioner every few um i think it was every three months so then i had my appointment for this um gel that they used to give me for my skin and i said to my gp you know i've got this abscess on my underarm but i don't know what it is you know I've not even i didn't even use the word abscess it was just a lump at the time just a really small lump and um she said you know take this these antibiotics and I think she gave me um, erythromycin. I'm not too sure. Um, I don't know why she didn't give me penicillin. Is it penicillin? Penicillin? Penicillin. Yeah. yeah, she didn't give that to me. Um, and it wasn't until about two years later when I found out about HS, I realized that um, they only don't give people penicillin if they're allergic, but I wasn't allergic. I'm not allergic to anything. So I found that quite a bit odd when I looked back into it, but you know, so then when I took the antibiotics, every, let's say, few days, it started to double in size. And it was just on my right underarm at the time. And then, you know, it still didn't hurt. And then eventually got about the size of, like, literally a golf ball. And then when I used to put my arm down, it would hurt because I believe it was putting pressure on the nerves. And, you know, even then, you know, being an alpha male, I didn't um, submit myself and go to the hospital, get a checkup. I just thought, you know, I'm going to ride it out. Eventually it will pop, in which it didn't. And then I remember once I was visiting a friend at university in another city in London. And um, I hadn't seen him for about a year. And I remember that morning, my arm was hurting so much. And then my mom was telling me to go to the hospital. And I was like, no, I'll be all right. So, you know, I got in the car, I drove. And obviously driving, putting your arm up, it didn't really hurt. So then I got there and then we were watching movies with some friends and then literally I, my underarm felt like it was going to pop. It was so hot. It was just all of a sudden, literally. And then I got up, I walked up and down. Everyone was asking what's going on, what's wrong. And I was just like, oh, you know, I had a boxing injury. Um, but, and in, but in my mind, I just didn't know what was going on, literally. And, you know, it, I remember feeling so hot and feeling as though my underarm was literally going to pop. 
in which it didn't you know i managed to put some ice on it <laughs> um and that kind of numbed the pain for a few hours and then i managed to fall asleep because obviously i wasn't in london and i didn't want to go to a hospital outside of london at the time i was only 18 my mom would have been upset um but you know when i managed to fall asleep and i woke up i was in so much pain i remember calling the A&E, which is accident and emergency and um they just told me to come to the hospital and um yeah in which i did i still hadn't gone home and then i went to the hospital i remember i was with my friend and we were cracking jokes you know i just had my arm up and i was just like you know i'm in pain but um i can it's bearable but i didn't want to go home because i knew falling asleep was going to be a big problem so you know i sat there for a few hours doctors came out and then they said that they were going to um, give me an operation, but I'd have to wait till the morning. And then they said that you can go home, but we can't give you the painkillers. And then I decided to stay. In the morning, I had the operation, which was just a drainage and incision. Mm -hmm. And then when I woke up from the operation, it was one of the most painful days of my life, if I'm honest with you, because I just woke up in pain, more pain than the pain I was feeling before the operation. And, you know, there was a big dressing and a big pad there. So um, I just thought, you know, and I actually asked the nurse and I said, you know, what happened? And he said, you know, they removed the damaged tissue and they um, closed it with um, stitches. That wasn't the case. You know, um, I, my girlfriend at the time came and a few other friends because obviously I couldn't drive. And then um, they discharged me from the hospital. However, the nurses and the doctors told me to check into a local hospital um, the next day in London. And when I did that, literally, sorry, one moment, my head is a bit itchy. That's literally, okay. when I did that, it was crazy because when the nurse removed the dressings, she started crying. And my girlfriend at the time, she also started crying. And I, and I was sort of like, I was literally like this, like, what's going on? I couldn't really see my underarm. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, when I just kind of glanced over, I could barely see what was going on. I just saw there was a big wound there. And then the nurse said to me, you know, you've been left with a four centimeter deep and wide hole. And at that point, it's like shock hit me. And I was just like, what? Yeah, I didn't know how to feel, if that makes sense. I, I'm not really in touch with my emotions that much. So I just remember just being in shock. And then what happened was they they um, pushed this surgical tissue um, inside. I forgot what it's called, but I'll get you the name later. Um, and it was about... It wasn't so thick, it was, it was only about this thin, but it was about 30 centimeters long, I would say. And it's, it's to soak up um, any of the fluids. Mm -hmm. So when, so she had to remove that and she read the notes on the computer and that was definitely the most painful day of my life ever. Because when she, she had to use tweezers to pull it out, I could feel everything. Something you'll ever. never forget. It sounds like it sounds like you had more of a, a wide excision, and they put a wound vac on. Yeah. Oh. Um, what they said was they wanted the um, wound to uh, recover from the inside out. Yes. So they yes, have to leave the hole. That's what it sounds like. Which yeah. actually is the, one of the best ways to do it. But um, to think that you're going in for an incision and drainage to what you just described as um very shocking to anybody mm -hmm. and very painful yeah it was wow it was it was so painful but you know what fast forward two weeks because i had to get my um dressings packed and unpacked every day yeah. um after two weeks you know i could be having a conversation and the nurse is just changing yeah. putting it out pushing it in and it's crazy how your body adapts because Two weeks later, I was, I was pretty much numb. I couldn't feel it. You know, if you really wanted to poke me, you could. And um, yeah, 
but that was just painful if I could cry, I would cry, but yeah. I just couldn't, <laughs> especially though there being two females there. But um, so that was operation number one. I recovered within six weeks, um, went back to the gym. But the issue that I had, right, was the wounds on my underarm, they wouldn't close. So I had just one wound and the way in which the skin recovered, it was kind of lumpy. So it's, rather than being flat, it was kind of lumpy like that. So then I think what would happen is, let me try and put my phone here. Hold on, let me see what I can do. So I think, is that staying up? Can you still see me? Yeah. Hold on. Can you still see and hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so rather than the skin being like this, it was kind of like that. So then the skin couldn't migrate together because the, the flesh had overgrown. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? So, but in my opinion, obviously looking back now, I kind of learned that why didn't they just, um, I think it's cauterize or something like that, the mm -hmm. top layer of skin. And then I'm pretty sure the skin would have closed and migrated together because it wasn't a big wound. It was just, there was too much tissue. Um, and, you know, that makes me wonder, like, there were so many things that I feel as though my HS definitely could have been they could have not necessarily put a stop to it, but they could have stopped it progressing right. and becoming the way in which it became, you know, yeah. because I would say it was stage three, it was very severe. Yeah. But luckily, mine was very um, defined to certain areas, which was my underarms and my groin area. I never had it anywhere else. Whereas I've seen on Google, some people have it all over their face, all over their body. Yes. And I can only imagine how difficult that would be. You know, um, but yeah, going back to, so I recovered six weeks back in the gym. The skin couldn't quite migrate together. It was a very tiny hole. Fast forward uh, 10 or so months, it started to seep. It started to, you know, um, yeah, it started to seep a little bit of clay fluid, I would say. And every now and then, um, the skin would just kind of tear more open and then scab up itself and then tear more open. And then, you know, I went back to the nurses and they would say, you know, it's going to close, in which it never really did. I mean, it did, but then it would open. You know, I could be sleeping, could be in the bath, could be in the shower. And then, so that was 2015. So fast forward to 2016, uh, around June-ish it started to bleed and then I started to feel um, uncomfortable in both my underarms. That was before the um, abscesses went to my other underarm as well. So then, how can I explain it? So then yeah, I remember being out um, and literally my t-shirts would get wet. You know, um, sometimes some yellow fluids, sometimes it was clear, very rarely um, some blood. And I remember training for the national championships that year. Um, and, you know, that's when abscesses on my other underarm started to form as well. But they would go and come back. And then I remember going back to my doctors and at the time they still didn't know what it was. And they just gave me different antibiotics all the time, uh, which I've I've read and heard is very common with HS patients. And then, unfortunately, uh, and then I remember trying to see a dermatologist. I couldn't get an appointment with one, and that took a long time. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, I did see one around November, after the national championships. So I actually got, I won the London Championships that year. And I remember I had loads of abscesses on both my underarms. And um, that was in, in October, I won the London Championships. And then in November, literally the day after my uh, birthday, November 5th was my birthday, I lost in the national semis to the um, eventual winner of the um, Amateur Boxing Championships in England. And he beat someone I beat in the finals. And I remember my coach and my team told me to take two weeks off 
and then get back in the gym. It wasn't because of HS or anything like that, that I didn't. I took time out of the gym. And then whilst I was resting after a week, I started to feel weak. This was the difference between operation number one and operation number two. Operation number one, it was more so there was an abscess, there was a lump, and it was painful when I put my arm down or when pressured. But this time round, I started to feel really weak. And it was weird because, you know, I, would, I was very fit. I had just won the London Championships. And then I was like, you know what, I'll take another week out of the gym. I'll come back next week. And I just started to feel even weaker. And deep down in the back of my mind, I knew what it was. Obviously, at this point, I had more abscesses formed on my left underarm as well. You know, I didn't know that it was HS, but I knew that whatever it was has come back or is progressing and getting worse. So then I finally got an appointment with a dermatologist and they told me, you know, you've got hydrotinitis suprativa. I never heard of it before. I was like, what's that? You know, went home, Googled it. It made sense. Didn't make me, it didn't make me feel better or relieved. It just made sense. And I remember I was very upset because I read that it was a chronic um, illness. And, you know, yeah, that was that. Yeah. Uh, and That's then, quite a journey. yeah, this was still before the new year, 2017. So this is still 2016. And then I remember it started to affect me in my grain area. I, used, I started getting this abscess. Um, this one abscess in my left thigh, in the thigh, and it was so painful. It's like every movement, it was like a sharp pain. That was the best way to describe it. So then I was December, it's December now, coming up to Christmas. Both my underarms, loads of abscesses, my groin area is hurting. I'm feeling weird in my groin area, I'm feeling weird in my underarms. And then I remember on Christmas Day, I was um, actually staying in an, uh, an apartment and I wasn't with my family. And it was only in half an hour drive and I drove an automatic car at the time. So it's very easy to drive, you know. And I remember it being Christmas Day and I literally couldn't get out of my bed until 7 p.m. And then when I finally got the strength to drive home, Christmas dinner was already done. And for me, it was like, that's when I knew something was really, really, really up because I've never not been able to get out of bed. You know, um, I've always been a strong individual. Um, my pain threshold, I believe, is high. And, you know, I was very upset, especially, you know, it being Christmas. And then I um, saw a doctor. They gave me some Cocodadromol and Cocodamol. Mm -hmm. um, antibiotics to take um, sorry painkillers to take alongside the antibiotics um, I think the antibiotics I was taking at the time was clindamycin okay um, do you know what that is yes absolutely um, there's another one that's similar to clindamycin they usually do that with rip um, starts with an R yeah rifidin is it rifidin yes. Or, yes. or something like that yeah that one so if I'm honest, they had given that to me before, but I didn't take it consistently. So then now I'm taking two of those of each twice a day. And I'm also taking, um, I think it was four um, of the, um, the um, two antibiotics, I'm sorry, painkillers. So it was tough because I started to feel like a zombie, literally. Right. You know, I was always tired, but I was still very weak, which for me was the most alarming issue for myself because I'm not a weak individual. Right. Anyways, New Year's Eve came and I remember sitting on social media and seeing all my friends going out and enjoying themselves. And I remember that day, I literally couldn't get out of bed. I literally couldn't get out of bed. And I just remember thinking eight weeks ago, I was London champion now i can't even get out of bed and i remember calling my older cousin because i never used to speak about hs with anybody 
I felt as though my friends wouldn't understand because when I was telling them I was ill, they, it's, in a sense, they never believed me. They just thought, oh, it's excuses. Oh, he's late because he's just late or not because I've got to put my dresses on and, you know, some days more abscesses form and it's like you have to gather some extra strength to get out of bed that morning. And then, you know, I spoke to my cousin and I said, you know, I think I need to have another operation. And I was scared. I was dreading it because, you know, operation number one, I didn't want to go through that again. And, you know, being put to sleep as well was something that's never happened to me before as well. And then, you know, I let it be. New Year's came, I think it was January 2nd or 3rd. I went to the A&E and, you know, I told them I was in a lot of pain. And then they said that I have to have an operation the following day. And I said, I remember asking them, oh, can't we do it in a week or something? Because in my mind, I knew I'd have to lay down for a long time, you know. And then they said, no, it has to be the following day. And I remember leaving and I said to my cousin, you know, I don't want to have the operation. I'll hold it down. And he said, no, you can't because you can't keep living like this. You know, some days you come to the gym and you train the next day, you can't come. Um, your tops are always covered in blood and yeah. pus, you know, one day you can't get out of bed, another you are, you do. And he said, you know, if you want to be a champion or if you want to live a normal life, you just need to have this operation. Yeah. You know, went back, did the operation, but it was crazy because 2017 for me was the most challenging year of my life to date because literally it was tough. I understand. Is there anything, can I ask, this is a, this is an important yeah. question. So many men do not, they're, they're getting better, mm -hmm. but not enough men speak out. And due to that, um, doctors are misdiagnosing and telling men that it's rare for men to get HS, which simply is not true. Um, so again, thank you for doing this because every story we hear from a man, every time they speak out, it helps. Is there anything, because a lot of men are going to be watching this, for you to encourage and anything you can say to the men in the community um, to encourage them to speak out more or any advice you can give to them? Um, I, we're going to run out of time here in about approximately 15 minutes, but I really want you to speak to them. Can you think of any encouraging words? Yeah, 100%. Do you know what I would say? Honestly, it's, it's may sound blase. And, you know, I'm sitting here seeming so relaxed, right? But I will say that you have to speak about it, especially to your family, friends, and doctors. Because if you don't speak about it, you won't be helped. Yeah. It's that simple. People keep misdiagnosing you. You know, I was upset. It took them two years for them to just diagnose me. But when I spoke to my surgeon, she said, on average, it takes six years. Easily. And we need to do better and we need to speak out about it because as well, I remember having my second operation, I had abscesses in my groin area in which I didn't tell the doctors about and they just operated on my underarms. So then they weren't suddenly going to go. I needed to be operated on, on my under on my groin area during the third operation. And, you know, when I look back and think about it, my HS was nowhere near as bad in 2017, where it was in November 2018 when I had my third operation. And also, it's important to speak about it because there are many people going through what we're going through. Yeah. And, you know, we all feel lonely. I remember surfing the net and I never found one successful HS story. Right. I never read a story where somebody overcame HS. And I always read it was obese people. It was people that smoked. It was mostly in females. And I was neither of those. You know, I've never been drunk in my life. I don't smoke, drink alcohol. Um, I'm, All the stigmas, I'm an, right? I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an elite athlete. You know, I boxed right. at international level. Yet, yeah, I suffered from HS. Right. You know, so therefore, what you see on the net may not be so accurate. 
and also I feel as though the internet shows the worst yeah but that may not be your reality and doctors may tell you you have something else and if we speak out about it then more people can get help and more people can in a weird way be okay because they're not the only ones you know when I finally got the courage to speak out about HS it connected me with so many people all over the world you know we wouldn't be having this conversation now if I hadn't exactly. done that exactly and there's been so many people who you know reach out to me on a daily basis till this day to say you know that I inspire them to an extent and yeah. and that's simply from sharing my story you don't know how somebody else can really be inspired by that to to do better to seek help to speak to their family and friends because it wasn't easy for me you know I remember my friends used to laugh at me and say oh you're dirty or maybe um, you're unhygienic or maybe you need to shower but you know what looking back yes it did hurt but all I can say is when people make judgment because of your HS just ask them to sim simply read up about it you know I was thinking about it the other month all my friends that used to you know joke about my HS they never actually took time out to actually google the skin disease exactly. the skin condition so therefore it was just a misunderstanding and I shouldn't take it so personally you're so right you're so spot on and that's one reason we created our HS Connect our organization and it's it, it's patient driven and it's ex, it hits exactly what you're talking about so people like you and and so many out there for their loved ones as well mm -hmm. like here's a place it, it's not full of misinformation and there's others like us um for a place for you to go easy to read resources and to please learn about our condition don't mm -hmm. judge don't you know a lot of places are invisible to see right mm -hmm. but there's so many as you uh, mentioned earlier there's so many invisible symptoms that we have we're, we're exhausted mm -hmm. we sometimes have low-grade fevers we don't feel well there's so much mm -hmm. more that comes with it along with the pain Mm -hmm. And then the surgeries that you guys have to go through, we have to go through. So mm -hmm. um, we're just really, really, you know, right now I know we're concentrating on men and it just breaks my heart that the men who don't seek medical care and who do not dare to speak out because I think they're afraid they're going to be, look like they're weak and they're not. Look at you. Mm -hmm. Look at your muscles. You're, you're a boxer, you're a professional boxer. You're not weak. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And you're speaking out proudly. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, there's a couple other questions here I'd really like to go over, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. And also, so if you run out of time. Uh, I think we just, Zoom just told us we had a little bit of an extension. I yeah. think that might be due to COVID. Thank you, COVID. <laughs> there's some positive. Um, I won't keep you much longer, but I just did want to, I didn't want to ignore the community questions. Mm -hmm. um, let's see what I think you um, answered a lot of some of this anyway but um, has it affected how you approach your training specifically focusing on the difference between your preparation compared to those not battling with the disease I mean I don't know you can speak on behalf of those not battling but has it affected your approach on your training um not anymore okay so but before what i used to do was i would to get around things so i would you know you have the gauze um you have the um i used to use something called um dressings by meeple so sometimes i use tape but i would rather use because i had quite huge abscesses i'll actually show you my underarms that's what my underarms look like now yes okay i see that yep nice wide excisions nice scars though i have to say <laughs> I'm, I'm one of those people i envy nice scars great job your shirt yeah, surgeon did yeah they done a great i don't know if you've seen have you seen the video of what yeah i have oh yes. Yeah. yes 
I do my yeah, research, yeah. buddy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um what was I saying? So what I used to do was I used to clean my uh, wounds with um saline solution. Yes. And then I would apply um about four layers four or so layers of gauze, the square one. Yep. I would, you know, fold it accordingly. And then I would apply uh I think it was a, a ten by fifteen centimeter meeple dressings. And I'll, you know, put it like that. Yes. And then in my growing area I used to just put some can't really put dressings there. So what I did was I would just fold some gauze and put it on my underwear. Um, so on the creases of your arm, yeah. you know, if that, that's the creased areas. And then that was about it. That's what I used to do. And, you know, I'd also wear dressings 24-7. Yeah. I felt yeah. very uncomfortable when I didn't wear dressings. Of course, you've got to let your skin breathe sometimes. So, you know, after I get out of the shower, maybe um, after cleaning up the saline solution, I'd maybe leave it out for about half an hour to an hour, maybe wear a vest like now or be topless if possible. And then I'd apply the dressings because one, all my clothes used to get ruined. Yes. And two, I just felt comfortable like that. Yeah. And then when it came to sport, it was the same thing. Literally the same thing, except when I had to compete, I couldn't wear dressings. So I just pray and hope um, it would stay dry. In which, you know, um, in the amateurs, we'd only box um, about 15 minutes or so. So it, it would hold up. But of course, in a professional game, it's different. And I never declared that I was on any medication or anything like that um, to the doctors. So realistically speaking, I probably wouldn't have been allowed to compete. But regardless, I still won championships while suffering from HS. And um, nowadays, um, after the skin graft operation, I don't need any more treatment um, other than every so often the skin does feel a little bit dry. So um, I tend to use a CBD oil, which um, actually, I don't know if it will work for everybody. Right. Like what me, because the skin there was very tough and dry um and i'll just apply that and sort of massage it that's what i did um at the beginning but now i can you know i moisturize every day generally speaking so i'll just moisturize that area a little bit more and that's about it great that's awesome i'm just sitting here picturing you boxing with abscesses under your arms and i just uh I just know how painful HS is. Um, and just you know what? I think that with that, your adrenaline kicks in. It, but you know, I'm, th I'm thinking the day it must. After you box, the day after you compete, oh my God, you might be stuck in bed or you're going to bleed a lot alongside the, the, the pus and the etc it must because there's times i have to i have my arm you can ask my husband in a sling mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I, I can't move my arm and i'm thinking he's boxing i mean back before your surgeries mm -hmm. yeah you're right that adrenaline and, and that uh desire to win you know mm -hmm. takes over i guess but wow mm -hmm. now that's a warrior we call we call our HS uh, community warriors, and that yeah, is I do. I do. You know what? I've actually got. So, I'm gonna let you in on an inside secret or something that I wanted to do because I want to uh, really become a HS advocate. No, that would be um, great. So when I box on TV, I'm signed to um, BT Sport, which is um, who work alongside ESPN in America. Okay. Um, on my gloves, I'm going to have HS Warrior engraved onto the gloves and um, onto my fight wear as well. But I think all my fights, it's always going to write HS Warrior on the gloves. And they're going to let you do that? Yeah, I already got the green light. So. Oh, yeah. I could hug you right now. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, and that's so, part yeah, of the don't problem tell we're seeing yeah. whenever we talk to anybody. Um, who's in the spotlight right their managers uh 
tell them no. Mm-hmm. Why? I mean, th- that's amazing. I can't wait to see that. And yeah, we would uh, also love to feature something like that on our website, your stuff. Mm-hmm. We really would. Um, yeah, and, and, and I was thinking down the line, I wanted to kind of create um, some some type of merch as my name becomes bigger and it was and I was going to call it something along the sides of um of invisible disease because yeah. that is what it is and you know people think that you're okay and you're fine because we we learn to, to deal with through. it so well and to push through but we're not okay and it's an invisible disease because you know it's in hidden areas right. you know for for the majority of us right so yeah i understand Um, i relate to everything you're saying um and i'm i know the men are going to relate to you very much so very Mm -hmm. much so and it's crazy you are so right because i've literally probably had i've definitely had i think 500 plus hs people reach out to me between 2018 to date and it's always nine eight out of ten times it's women well, it's we're going to change men. that. We're changing and also that. When it, and also when it is men, it always seems to come from a page that is a private page, that almost like a fake page. So you've actually, you've actually made me very aware of that. Um, yeah. I never thought about it that way. A lot of men don't really reach out even speak. But I remember myself just being so embarrassed. Um, I remember my uh, underwear was always, you know, sometimes covered in blood. Mm-hmm. and pass and my mom used to ask me I remember once my mom saw my um dirty clothes basket and she was like what's that and I was just like oh it's nothing it's nothing and you know to a point where she started to go through uh, my things and she'd always ask me and I'd say oh no I'm okay I'm okay and literally I never even spoke to any doctor about me having HS until my third operation yep I'm so glad you are now very uh, very I, happy that you are now I, I try to all the time honestly i try to all the time where i can and i promise you know once covid is over in my post fight interviews like i said on my gloves on my kit somewhere 100 percent, i have hs worry there i can't wait i can't wait is there anything else you want to share and i'm going to ask you to stay on just for mm-hmm. three minutes when we stop recording if that's okay you're not gonna, um, I can, I'm not going to lie. I can stay as long as you want me for right now. No, God, don't tell me that. Me and you'll be talking all the time. Um, we can, we can like, again, you know, if you have loads more questions, we can, you can fire them ahead. Do honestly. you have anything else you want to share with the HS community as a whole? Um, and again, especially the men before we... Is there anything you ever wanted to I'll say? Yeah, I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking, I'm thinking. You know, if people don't understand, honestly, it is what it is. You just, unfortunately, you have to keep it moving. And you have to also try. When people don't understand the first time, don't be upset at them. You know, nobody knows what we're going through. There's only so much exactly. they can hear or even try to understand or try to comprehend. However, don't make that close your heart, you know, don't make that um, look at people in a negative type of way, you know, at the end of the day, you're still here, you're still fighting, and you're winning the battle, eventually one day, you know, we can only keep praying and hoping that it becomes easier, and it's also very important to speak about it, because not many doctors know about HS, there's not many at all know about HS. I've been, I've seen and spoken to so many doctors over the years. No one really knew. Especially in the UK. Imagine. Especially in the UK. And I've come to learn there's a lot of people in the UK that suffer from HS. At one point, I thought I was the only one. And I'm sure there probably is more athletes that do. But we have oh. to step up and speak about it. And if we don't speak about it, how do we, as a community hope to see the Change. end of the tunnel 
and see change and see improvements for treatment. There's so many different types of treatment and it just seems as though nothing is ever HS specific, yep. even down to the medication. You know, I was given medication that people with um, TB and, H and HIV have. And, you know, at the end of the day, we just need to speak about it because mm -hmm. there is a community out there and we can help each other feel better at least you know even if we've got to even if there's someone out there that can listen yeah you know when we feel through pain or someone who can give advice on what types of dressings to use or is this dressing or um too tough on the skin or does applying gauze um, on using saline solution and which type of soap should i use um, if any you know those little things they, they make a difference because uh, i remember suffering in that not knowing what to do they're just giving me is the gauze is the tape that's right. it but there's and ways they, in which doctors you can don't make even know. a little bit easier pardon doctors don't even know half the time yeah. we have to figure it out 100 mm -hmm, so it's, it's it's crazy because you know thinking back like i said you know when they could have just cauterized um, the top layer of the of the um, the wound, the skin would have migrated together. All those little things, and it's and it's such a shame because we're always out here having to educate ourselves yeah. on our own. But if we unite, and yeah, that's, that's what we're doing right now, buddy. We are uniting. Do you have a Facebook that. group? Yes, and I'm gonna when we hang up, I'm gonna send that to you. I just realized of all the social media we're connected in, you are not in our support group and you need to be. I need to be. I need to be. I'm not the most social person. It's I mean, okay, even right. if you're in the background. <laughs> that's fine. Um at times I'm quiet, but okay. I think that I don't blame HS, but I think that in my life so many things have happened. And then with the HS thing, no one believing me that I was ill until I had to put out that video. It definitely made me become a closed off person, if I'm honest, you know. I know how to play that character of, of, um, of just being a, a, a personality. But really and truly, after being going through what I went through, it made me a quiet person, made me keep myself to myself you know, for people to genuinely believe, and even family as well, if I'm honest with you, it took for them to see me in that condition, for them to give me a break or understand, oh, you know what, he's ill. For me, it's something that I forgive, but I can never forget. So, you know, generally speaking, I go through my quiet phases. But, you know, when it's HS related, I always try my best to, to try and be involved.